It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty wood. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please, won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please, won't you be my neighbor? Were the iconic and idealistic words that started every segment of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. A neighborhood where everyone and everything just seemed so happy and bright. Where everybody just seemed to get along in this particular neighborhood. Now admit it, we'd all like to be a part of Mr. Na- uh, Rogers' Neighborhood, right? Okay, well today's lesson is in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, if you want to open your Bibles to there. And we need to start thinking about Jesus Christ as being Lord of our relationships. Now the particular scripture we're going to be talking about today is the one that says, love our neighbors. Now let me ask you a question. Anyone here ever had a bad neighbor in their lifetime? I mean, just one of those crazy neighbors? You know, I think my favorite one, and I've had several of them. I think they follow me. But I think my favorite one was I had this one guy, and at Easter time, he would blow up this inflatable rabbit, and he would hang it in a tree in my front yard. And he had strings or something attached to it, and he would pull it, and he would make the arms go up and down. And then he had this megaphone. So he would start talking, and you'd have to look out your window, and you would see this inflatable rabbit up there. Now, I never confronted him about this. Don't know why he did it, but he did. He was also a guy that if you'd be out walking and walking down the street, he would drive behind you in his car with this megaphone going and talk to you out of his window. (laughs) Go figure. So I've had several others, but that was always my favorite one. But, you know, the truth of it is our neighborhoods that we live in are far from perfect, And let's face it, sometimes neighbors can just be a pain in the neck, right? Well, you're not alone if you ever had a bad neighbor. As a matter of fact, there was a survey taken by State Farm, like a good neighbor, right? State Farm is there. There was was a survey taken, and according to this survey, 60% of Americans have problems with their neighbors, so you're not alone. There's even a website that I found called Neighbors from Hell. So if you have one of these neighbors, you can actually go in there and vent about them and tell all your frustrations about why this neighbor was such a bad or crazy neighbor. If you think this is something new, let's go back several thousand years, where Solomon says in Proverbs 25, 17, Let your foot rarely be in your neighbor's house, or he'll become weary of you and soon hate you. I think the translation goes something like this. If you're the type of person that's just always hanging around your neighbor and talk, 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 pretty soon you got to know when to go home because they're going to get tired of you and they're going to get weary of you, and pretty soon they might even hate you. So even back in Solomon's day, they had this same problem. I have to imagine that in the small city of Barberton, we probably have some problems with our neighbors. Let me give you a scenario and see if this sounds familiar to you at all. It's a beautiful summer evening, kind of like last night, you know, maybe in the mid-70s, 75 degrees. There's a beautiful breeze going across the evening air. It's one of those kind of nights when you go and you just open all your windows up and you turn the air conditioner off. It's a Bob Moorhead evening. He, he likes to talk about, I have Facebook, about, you know, it could be a little bit cooler out. 
Well, this would be your kind of evening, Bob, where you can open up all the windows, turn the air conditioner off, and you pour yourself a nice glass of iced tea or lemonade, and you go out and you sit on your back deck. You prop your feet up, and you're just oh, taking in that beautiful fresh air that the Lord has given us. And you kind of drift off a little bit, and all of a sudden, the air is not so fresh anymore. And you're just kind of <laughs> giving it the sniff test. And you open your eyes, and, and there's this kind of stench in the air. And you look over in the distance, and you see this kind of gray fog that's, that's heading in your direction. And the stench becomes overwhelming. Your eyes begin to turn red. Your throat begins to get sore. You jump up. You run in the house. You close all the windows back up before it gets into your house. And you think, it's that guy two streets down that just loves to burn things. Ever experience that? Just listen. I don't know what he's burning. He's either burning leaves. He's burning trash. You know, isn't there laws against this kind of stuff in the city of Barberton? I mean, where's the police? Where's the fire department when you need them? I mean, the day of the 55-gallon drum in your backyard goes back about, some of you probably remember that, right? About 55 years ago, 50 years ago, when you could burn everything right in your backyard. So what starts out to be a beautiful evening is completely ruined by an inconsiderate neighbor. So you go back into the house. As I said, you closed all the windows up. Well, after a while, it calms down. Smokey the Bear puts the fire out. You kind of open the windows back up a little bit again. It's getting towards evening, and you're getting a little bit sleepy. So you go fix yourself a nice big glass of that sleepy time chamomile tea, right? You kind of sip on that and, and sit in your living room, and pretty soon it's time for bed. And you go and you, you roll back the covers and you get in, and it just so, feels so nice and cozy in your bed. And you get to that place to where, you know that little twilight sleep where you're kind of half in and half out, and it, you're just so just totally relaxed. You're just about ready to go into that REM sleep, and all of a sudden, you hear this noise outside the window. It sounds like a siren going off. You sit up straight in bed. What in the world is going on? And then you remember, oh yeah, the guy two doors down that has the beagle lets him out. They think 11 o'clock at night's a great time for a dog to go pee, right? And there's the stray cat there, and the bellowing begins. You're all familiar with the bellowing of a beagle, beagle, right? I had a neighbor that had one of those too. And it just goes on. You know, and it'd be okay if it was just a matter of the beagle doing this for a couple of minutes and they brought him in, but it goes on for 5 and 10 and 15 minutes and you begin to think to yourself, is this ever going to stop? And finally, the final sound you hear is the front door open and it says, Blue, shut up and get in here. And finally, the noise stops. But the problem is, you're wide awake. And you watch the seconds on the clock tick by and it's, it's 12 o'clock and it's 1 o'clock in the morning and you have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go to work. And you're going to be completely exhausted. You decide that at this point the only thing to do is maybe read. So you reach over and you get your Bible off the end table and you open it up and you look down and the first words you see are this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Seriously? So on your outlines, I want you to write, sometimes loving our neighbors requires patience. Sometimes loving a neighbor requires patience. We're about to discover that in the 21st century, it was just as hard to love your neighbor as it was in the 1st century. If you look in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29, we find Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Now, they, this is the 72. They just get back from the, what we call the limited commission, and they're out preaching uh, from town to town and preparing the way for Jesus. And it appears that a crowd begins to gather, and they want to hear what Jesus has to say. And standing in this crowd is this lawyer. Now, it says in there that he was an expert in the law. 
What he was an expert at was, it was probably one of the scribes, and he spent all of his time writing down the scriptures and studying the scriptures and understanding. He was their scholar. He was going to be their great debater. And so he's about to stun Jesus and this crowd with a question that he's about to ask, or so he thought. If you look in verse 25, it says, he walks up to Jesus and he asks the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's a legit question, right? I mean, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a question that every one of us should be asking. Now, I love what Jesus does here. It's absolutely brilliant. Rather than feed into his ego and answer the question for him, he says to him, hey, you're the expert. How does it read to you? What do you think? What do you see when you read this? And so the lawyer quotes the scripture that we just read. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Then he just kind of stands back and he waits for Jesus' rebuttal. But this is also brilliant on Jesus' part. No no rebuttal comes. He doesn't even bother to argue with him. He just said, you know what? You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. If you do this, you'll live. It's kind of interesting. Don't you hate it when you're trying to get into an argument with somebody and they just agree with you? Husbands do this all the time, by the way. Just so you know that. When when the argument starts, you're absolutely right. So this is the tactic that Jesus uses with him. But for some reason, it appears that this guy has a problem with the word neighbor. He wants to limit it to just certain classes of people. Now, if you look carefully at the next verse, it says, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and just who is my neighbor? You know, the text doesn't tell us why he's bringing this up. I mean, Jesus didn't even accuse this guy of anything, did he? But he's got a problem that's going on inside of his head with certain classes of people. So he asks the question. It almost makes me wonder if maybe this guy might not have been present at the Sermon on the Mount. If you remember last week, Jeremy brought this passage up. Remember on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, You have heard it said that you're to love your enemy, or excuse me, love your neighbor and to hate your enemy. I wonder where they heard that said at. Because it's not in the law, it's not in any scripture, but he says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, see, this is one of those Jewish laws that they came up with. They logically concluded that if you love your neighbor, you must automatically hate your enemy. Well, what does Jesus say? Jesus said, love your neighbor, but also love your, your enemy. Love those who persecute you. Love those who mistreat you. Because what reward is there if you just greet to the people that like you? He says even the pagans and the tax collectors do that. And these were two groups of people that the Jews absolutely hated. So, on your outline, write down, sometimes loving your neighbor requires us to love those that we may not like. Sometimes it requires us to love those that we may not like. Now, perhaps he wanted Jesus to elaborate on this. Who is my neighbor, Jesus? Is it that tax collector that steals all the money out of our pockets and lines our own? Is it the pagan that worships some other god? Or maybe it's even those horrible, horrible Samaritans that intermarry with other countries and worship their idols along with with their own god, Jehovah. Who is it, Jesus? Just tell us. Are they my neighbor too? I think we might be getting to the crux of the matter with this Samaritan. What's interesting here is the word love. It's not the word phileo that normally, you know, we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, but it's actually the word agape, which means love your neighbor, meaning having an unselfish, caring love for another individual whether you like them or not. It's the exact same love that God has for you and has for me while we were yet sinners. It's the agape love. So Jesus, knowing this, he goes on to tell the story about what we know as the parable of the Good Samaritan. 
In verse 30 it says, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. Now, you got to picture this. Here's a guy, I mean, not only did they beat him up, and he's a bloody mess, and he's half dead, but he's stripped naked, and he's laying on the road, and Jesus says, along comes a priest. Ah, top of the hierarchy, right? This priest comes along, and he's walking down the road, and he looks, and he sees this guy laying there, and he's not sure, is that, is that a dead animal? What's in the road? And the closer he gets, he begins to realize that this is a human being laying there. And of all the people in the world, a, a religious priest is going to be the guy that's going to help him, right? But the priest looks at him and says, well, you know, I'm heading for Jerusalem, and we got a service that's going to be starting before long, and I, I better hurry up and get there because i got to take care of all the sacrifices and the things for the people. So he crosses over to the other side of the road. I, I always find that term interesting, crossing to the other side of the road. Because when I cross to the other side of the road, what happens? I, I, I'm guilty of this, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes when I see the guys holding the sign up and it's two lanes... I'll move to the other side because there's some kind of a guilty feeling I have when I pull up there and I look that guy in the eye and he's waving at me and doing all this stuff that I feel like I need to give him some money every time. So I think sometimes we do that, you know. We, we kind of pull to the other side of the road. The, the little Girl Scouts that set up in Giant Eagle and you go out the other door, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> that kind of thing, yeah. You, you go to the other side of the road. So anyway, they said... Then he says, a Levite comes by. Now, the Levite, he takes care of all the ministerial things of the service. You know, he's going to take care of setting it up and for the sacrifices and stuff, and he takes care of all the music. And he comes along, and he sees the guy laying there, and he kind of looks at his watch and says, you know, I really should help this guy. I really should. But, you know, this service really depends on me, and I don't have a lot of time, and I'm running late the way it is. So he also crosses to the other side of the road. But then a Samaritan comes along. Oh, not the Samaritans. Of all the people for him to use in this illustration, I find it's interesting that he uses the Samaritans that's so hated by the Jewish people that they won't even cross through their land. They'll go across the Jordan River to avoid going through their land. That's how hated they are. But along comes a Samaritan. He comes to where the man is. He sees him, and his first response is what? It's pity on him. He doesn't think about what time it is. He doesn't think about where he needs to be or where he's going. He has pity on him. He has compassion for this person. It says, so he went and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He put him on his own donkey he brings him to the Holiday Inn, he puts him up for the night, and he takes care of him. You know, it gives all indication here that the guy actually spent the night there watching over this person so that, to make sure that he would be okay in the morning. Because it says the next day, he takes out some money, he gives it to the innkeeper, and he says, look after him, and notice this, and when I return. Not only does he take care of him and bring him to a place to stay, but he's going to come back and check on this guy. And I'll reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. He shares three t things, his time, his money, and his compassion. Now, you've got to love the next question. Jesus turns to this expert of the law and he says, now which of these three do you think was a neighbor to this person. You know, if I was that expert, I don't even know how I could look up at Jesus at this point. I, I almost feel like he might have asked this in the form of a question. Kind of one of those where you're kind of looking down at the ground at this point, and you kind of look up with your eyes like this, and you go, the one that showed mercy? And Jesus said, you're absolutely correct. Go your way and do this kind of impact that has when Jesus says to go his way and do this and be like a Samaritan. Be like a Samaritan. Amazing. Well, you know, when Jesus gives a lesson like this, 
You know, I think our first inclination is we want to high-five Jesus. Way to go, man. You really put this guy in his place, didn't you? But you know, these stories are for us as well as for this expert of the law. Perhaps we ask the very same questions. We might not say, who is my neighbor? But we might do it in other ways. Just wonder, do we ever include certain people in our life while excluding others? Do I ever mentally judge somebody that has a different lifestyle than maybe what I have? Somebody that doesn't dress like me or talk like me or is as educated as I am or act like me or don't have the same skin color that I have? Do I find that I only associate with people that are like me? Or do I associate with people that look different? What about people that look different by choice? You know, you see it more and more today. I mean, there's people that are they're covered with tattoos from head to toe, and they've got all kinds of piercings going on. Do you ever find yourself maybe just kind of avoiding those people because they scare you? You never know. What about people that are different for other reasons that are not of choice? Do you ever see somebody with a disability, uh, maybe in the mall, there, there's a guy up in the mall that they put out there all the time, and you just kind of feel uncomfortable about that, and you walk in a different direction? Maybe sometimes we ask the question, who's my neighbor? Who's the person I should associate with? You know, the reality is this. We live in an unneighborly world. People like their privacy. People come home, they open their garage door up, they drive in, they shut the garage door, they go in their house, and they hide behind their iPhones and their iPads, and they don't have any connection with the rest of the world. You know, Jeremy's been, been preaching for several years now with this idea about we are to become disciples that make disciples that make disciples. But my question today is, how do we become disciples that make disciples if we don't bring the gospel of salvation to other people? It's, it's kind of interesting. He, he gave me a book. It was called The Art of Neighboring, and I got a chance to read enough of it to get the gist of the book. And there's two pastors that have come to the conclusion, rather than all these campaigns and all these programs and all these gimmicks that we have to try to, to bring people into the church, that perhaps it's the key to this whole thing is wrapped up in the second commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. They conclude that most of us hardly even know our literal neighbors. They believe that being neighborly will build relationships and eventually open up doors of opportunity. Perhaps we need to start in our own backyard. So who is my neighbor? Is it the person that lives to the right and left of me? Yeah, it is. But it's also everybody that I come in contact with every day of my life. My coworkers, my boss, the waitresses at the diner, the cashier at the grocery store, the person that delivers my newspaper, my friends, my family, my church. These are all my neighbors. But what about the drug addict, the gays, the Muslims, the blacks, the whites, the Jews, the drunkards, the bum on the street, the homeless, the obnoxious? The bully, the politician, the loud, the rude, the crude, the pushy. Are they not my neighbors too? Those aren't warm and fuzzy, are they? They're a little uncomfortable when we hear about those. So how do we fulfill this command to love our neighbor as ourself? You know, think about the second part of that command. Love your neighbor like what? Like yourself. We're pretty good at loving ourselves, aren't we? I mean, I know what I need. I try to keep myself pretty healthy. If, if something goes wrong and I get a cut, I'm going to bandage it up. I clothe myself, I feed myself, I take care of myself. Love your neighbor as yourself. I even pray for myself. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's an interesting concept not to just love them, but to love them like we would love me. On your outline... Write down, being neighborly is simply seeing an opportunity and acting upon it. You know, there's dozens and dozens of opportunities you have out there every single day to love your neighbor. I'll give you one real good example. If you go over to Giant Eagle, and probably you guys see me over there all the time. I run into you all the time over there, some of you. 
If you're over at Giant Eagle or any, any parking lot, it's always interesting to me that they put the wheelchair parking or the handicap parking right up here by the store. Now, you know why they do that? Because it's a shorter distance than the person to walk from there to the store. Well, what's interesting to me is they put the carts down here at the other end or in the middle. My question always to myself is, is how does that disabled person that comes out with their cart and loads things up in their car, what are they going to do with the cart? They just leave it there. They're not going to take it all the way down there. So I started making it a point that when I go to Giant Eagle, and especially if I see an elderly person up there, and especially if it's in the wintertime, I kind of, as I'm unloading my cart, I take my time and I watch for them to finish up. And when they do, I just walk up and say, can I take your cart for you? And it's funny. It's such a simple thing, but you see this big smile come across their face, and they're like, well, yes, thank you. And they see something hopefully different about me, and I don't know if I'll ever see them again or not, but maybe I will run into again, and it'll start a relationship, it'll start a conversation, and when you get to know people, because you can't be neighborly unless you know people, and when you get to know people, then you can start talking about spiritual things to them. I'm going to end today with a little test. Uh, In the book, this was in the book actually, uh, if you want to put that up there, Becky, with the the houses. In the book, actually somebody called it the, the test of shame. Now if you envision that this house in the middle is you, and actually they do down the street and the whole thing, but I'm just going to make it real simple, and you can kind of take this home and fill this out, but on your left is a neighbor, on your right is a neighbor. Write down how much you know about the person to the right or left to you in your neighborhood. Now, I started out just saying, what about their names? You know, if you don't even know the names of the people that live to the right and left of you, you've got some work to do. You know, you you need to get to know your neighbor a little bit, unless they're the crazy one and then, you know. But, you know, you can ask yourself, do they have children? Do you even know if they have children? Do you know their children's name? What about recreation? Do you know what your neighbors do for recreation? Where do they work at? Do they work? Are they retired? What about where do they go to church or do they go to church? You know, these are real simple things just with a conversation you can find out and get to know your neighbor. Once you take this home and fill it out, try to do the thing, too, about do about the next houses down, the next houses down across the street. And, I, you know, I think soon we're going to find out we really don't know a whole lot just about the people in our neighborhood. And this is the whole point of this book is if we just get to know them, we might start having conversations and talking about perhaps coming to First Church of Christ and being a part with us. How important is this command? Well, I'm just simply going to say this. It's the second greatest command in the entire Bible. Other than love the Lord your God with all your heart, it's the second greatest command is to love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to end there today, but today if you're not a Christian, I really don't need you to ask yourself, who's my neighbor, I need you to ask the question, who's my savior? You know, Acts 4.12 tells us that there's no salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven that's been given among men by which we must be saved, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're in need of a savior, if you're in need of salvation today, the the baptistry's ready, Uh, you can come forward and be baptized into Christ and rise up to walk in the newness of life. If you just need to come forward and maybe you need prayers uh, from the elders, you have situations in your life that you'd like to talk about, we just ask that you come forward and do this as together we stand and sing.